Hi. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, child. Oh, y'all are quite a bunch today. <laughs> okay, Shorty, I understand. Shorty, yeah? <laughs> okay. That's for sure. In your trouble, heavy eyes.
morning, church. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Good, TJ. Thank you. <laughs> All right, a couple of announcements this morning. First and foremost, Miss Vera, little Vera, is going home today. So she's able to be on room air. Her oxygen saturations are normal, so that's amazing and awesome. And so we praise God for that. Thank you, Lord, for healing her. And uh, we also just continue to pray for William, too. He's sick, but he's home. So we just pray for all of them to be fully restored, fully healed, to, to full health. And so we just ask God for that. Um, other announcement, yes, we will be here on Christmas Eve um, on the 24th, so we'll be here the 18th and then the 24th, but not the 25th, because um, they're closed. <laughs> Rank Center is closed, so we won't be here. Um, but also with that, there will be no New Year's service, yeah, so that weekend, we'll miss that weekend as well. So we'll pick up again on the 8th of January, so kind of plan on that. For the new year. Praise God we made it this far and praise God we go a little bit farther. Amen. All right, last, this is probably one of my favorite announcements of the whole year, um, is we're going to do a little cookie and cookie and treat exchange. So if you have some favorite cookies, some things that you like to make this time of year for family or friends, I like to make fudge myself personally. Um, it's the best fudge <coughs> in the world. But, and Sorbonne's okay too. And Sorbonne's okay too. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> but we're going <laughs> to. We want to do a little cookie exchange um, for us here at the church. So bring some cookies or treats and your favorite stuff. Question? It says Sunday, December 24th. Oh, yes. well, Saturday. 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 So we'll, we'll exchange those cookies. Saturday. We'll exchange those cookies on the 24th. That's Saturday. Uh, okay. So we have a little bit of time to prepare, to cook, to bake, whatever it may be. So. And with that, open your Bibles up to John chapter 21. breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he, had, because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know what? You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. So as we continue to finish out this chapter of John, God is giving us a couple of reminders as this gospel comes to a close. Like last week, we looked at how we need to remember to go fishing, to share the good news that we as believers have heard and received, and that you and I, the church, are on a mission. And not to keep captive the gospel message, but to go forth and to share it to a lost and dying world. And now we come across 
another great reminder, another foundational truth the Lord wants us to see, and one we have to remember, one we need to keep, one we need to hold fast to. That Jesus has to be our greatest love. He has to be our greatest love. He has to be whom we love most. He is our number one above all things and above all people, above everything. He has to be our greatest love. And the Lord even makes mention of this previously during his ministry back before the cross. Look over to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, verse 26, it says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus isn't saying here to hate your family, your loved ones, no matter how strange or weird they might be. He's not even saying to hate yourself. What he's telling this crowd, and he's reminding us, church, and his followers, is that we are to love him most. And with our family and our friends, we are still going to love them, just not as much as we love Jesus. And that can be a hard pill to swallow sometimes. That can be hard to digest for some people. But not just for us, but for those around us. Many Christians will never have to make that painful choice of turning uh, their lives away from their family in order to follow Christ. But around the world, there are many other Christians who face shunning or disowning if, uh, <coughs> excuse me, or even persecution from their families. There was a gentleman back in 2006, a former Muslim, who one Sunday morning set his alarm early that day because he wanted to spend time reading his Bible and praying because it was a special day. He was supposed to be baptized. And he was supposed to be baptized at a fellowship with other Iranian believers. But the family of this man had discovered what he was planning to do. So before his alarm went off that morning, several of his family members came together, boiled water in a saucepan, and then they poured it on his body, on his sleeping body. Scolding and searing both his arms and his legs. His family was so enraged and so angry that he was a Christian and giving up the Muslim religion. They believed this man was turning his back on his family. So they poured water, boiling water on him, searing his flesh. But this didn't stop the man. This didn't stop him at all. He still went to the baptism anyways. And he was standing before those gathered with the burns on his body very visible. And this man declared to all around him, he said, no matter what they do to me, I will love Jesus. And even after the baptism, the man said he felt like standing in the center of the city and shouting to everyone around him that he belongs to Christ. And some, like this man, may be forced to live in a way that is perceived as hateful toward their families and their loved ones. And as Jesus would tell us, we would have to count the cost. We would have to count the cost, the cost of being a disciple, a follower of Jesus, and that most definitely includes the cost of having Him, the Son of God, our Savior, be our first and greatest love above all else. This can be a heavy cost, but what is, but that is what is required for us to truly be a follower of Jesus. And that is what we are reminded of as Jesus turns and focuses on one of His closest followers, Peter. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind, yes, Jesus is addressing Peter here, but don't forget that this easily could be us too. And maybe for some it has been us. I know for myself, the Lord has had to have this conversation with me a couple of times. <clears throat> but Peter very much represents most of us on our journey of faith. The key here for us, though, is to understand this truth and then decide what we're going to do with that. We have to make that decision of what to do with it. So, so for context's sake, we need to know why the Lord is addressing Peter here. So flip over back to John 13. Seems like forever to go over to John 13. <laughs> we'll pick up in verse 36. This 
Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can, I not, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Here at the end of John 13, after the Lord washed the disciples' feet, and the Last Supper had taken place, Jesus tells his disciples that he must depart for a little while. We know Jesus is speaking of his cross. But Peter, not truly understanding and speaking from a place of pride and even seeking his own glory, he says he will lay down his life for Jesus. And Jesus replies, will you really, Peter? Will you really do that for me? Right. That's a good question for us. Will we do that, church? Will you do that, Christian? Will you lay down your life? Because it requires a greater love. Jesus said, a greater love no man had no man than this. A greater love has no man than this, that he was willingly lay down his life for his friends. And we see this in our Savior's cross. But we don't see this in Peter. Not yet. Okay? We know that Peter denied Jesus three times as a matter of fact after the Lord was arrested. His disciple wasn't there yet. He wasn't there yet. And sadly, many who occupy seats in the church today are not there yet, or desire not to even go there, or are taught not to go there. There's a church in our area I went to a couple weeks ago, and in their main lobby, there's a big sign, it's all lighted up and fancy, it looks pretty cool. And it reads, No Jesus. Sounds okay, but I have an issue with that. And because many people do know Jesus. That's not the problem. That isn't the issue. The issue is that very few truly love him. Many people know Jesus. I don't want to just know him. I want us to love him. Why? Because he loved us first. He came down from heaven and showed us how much God loves us. By being nailed to that cross. Paying for our sins and giving us life. No greater love than this. I don't just want to know this guy. I want to love him and I want to give my life to him for all eternity. Because of what he's done for me. Or what he's done for you. For the love he has shown us. I want to love him with every fiber of my being. All right, I love you and I pray that is your heart too. He has to be our greatest love. And that is what the Lord is getting at with Peter here. And what he's showing us this morning. And there's a few things we need to look at. There's a few things we need to understand. So back in John chapter 21, verse 15. It says, when, Pete, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Verse 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. So the first thing I want us to notice, that we need to notice, here with Peter, is that we need to go to our great love. We need to return to our great love. All right, Peter made a mistake. He denied Jesus three times, but he was able to return to the Lord. And maybe that is some of us this morning. Something or someone else has taken the Lord's place in our lives. And maybe to someone listening today or watching, uh, or watching today, Jesus has never had that place in our life. We've been denying him for our whole life. And we need to understand and see that we can still go to him, but there's still time. We can still return to Jesus, because he won't turn us away. And we see that with Peter here. Jesus never denies Peter, or doesn't refuse to be around him. Peter denied or now Jesus three times, but Jesus never refused to be around Peter after that. He is still allowed in the Lord's company, even after making his mistake. And this is very much the opposite of how the world behaves, isn't it? Right? It's one and done. That's the world's motto. 
But now with Jesus, Peter is still his follower, a disciple, he's still in the presence of the risen Lord. He's still loved by God. And needing to be realigned, if you will, on what it means to be a follower of Christ. When Peter swam to shore after finding out that it was Jesus telling them to cast their net on the other side of the boat, we don't see Jesus refusing to be around Peter once he makes it to the shore. Or telling him, go away because you hurt me. Even here, Peter shared a meal with our Lord. Peter made mistakes, just like we all do. But he was able to return to the Lord and get his heart back in the right order. That is something we need to learn, church. As a follower of Jesus, when we make a mistake, like not having Jesus be our first and greatest love, we need to go towards Jesus and not turn away from him. When we fail, we need to go back to Jesus and have him set us straight again. Instead of having these pity parties thinking God loves you less. Listen, there's nothing you can do that we can do for God to love us any more or any less. All of our mistakes... All of our failures hung on that cross where we find God's love for us. And if we think God loves us any less, then we're not looking at the cross. Even the opposite is true. If we think God loves us more than others, then we ain't looking at the cross. Because he loves others just the same. And we see that where he was crucified. Others will fall into a works. I mean, otherwise we'll fall into a works-based faith, right? I did this so God should love me more. Right? Or I made this mistake so God loves me less. Don't fall into that trap. Because then we'll minimize what has been done for us and put salvation back in our hands and not in His. And we can't save anybody, including ourselves. So Jesus asked Peter a question. It's a great question. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? This is our second thing to look, up, look at and take note of, is that Jesus has to be our greatest love. In other words, you say, am I your greatest love? In Matthew 26, verse 35, Peter adamantly stated to Jesus, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. But we know Peter did. Why? Because he was more worried about his own life in the life of Jesus. He loved his own life more than that of the Savior. Jesus wasn't his greatest love at that particular time, and Peter now realizes it, and we see this in his response to the Lord's inquiries. Right? The word Jesus uses for love here is that agape love. Right? Peter, do you agape love me? Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I believe, or if I leo, love you, that brotherly love, right? Meaning brotherly love or fond affection. Peter now knows he's not there yet, but that is where the follower is headed, is to that agape love. That is where all of us are headed, to love God sacrificially, that agape love, with all of our lives and all of our hearts, for Jesus to be the greatest in our life. And when we first read this verse, it's tempting to ask, what does Jesus mean by deeds? What are these? What is he talking about? Some commentators say he was referring to other men. Others would say it was the fishing. It was the fish or the fishing boat or the occupation he held prior to Jesus coming into his life. But I like how it's left a little obscure because it causes us to look and evaluate everything. Everything in our own lives. And what I mean, everything, I mean everything. <laughs> our stuff or our possessions families and even ourselves, our own lives, Jesus has to be who and what we love the most. Which for many is hard for them to do. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is hard. And especially in our own country. Right? We love ease. We love comfort. We love pleasure and entertainment. But Jesus has to be above those. We love our kids and our families, our moms and our dads, our friends, but Jesus even has to be above them. We love our spouses. I love my wife. But Jesus has to be even above her. Probably the hardest one, though, is ourselves. We love ourselves. 
right? Self-love is that big push that seems to be going on around the world today. It's crept its way into the church too, and even coming from the pulpit itself in some churches. And the Bible says in these last days, people will be lovers of themselves. I believe we're there. I would even say that this is the biggest obstacle everyone will have to face. Why? Because all these other things, the money, the house, the cars, the jobs, the friends, the family, the phone, the social media, whatever it may be, ties right back into here. Ties right back into me. And what I, what I enjoy, what benefits me, but even Jesus has to be above me. He has to be above me. He has to be loved more than I love myself. Our greatest love as a church and as a follower of Jesus has to be Him. John 12, 25, the Bible tells us that whoever loves his life will lose it. But whoever hates his life, there's that word again, hates. In other words, meaning loves less. Whoever hates his life or loves his life less in this world will keep it for all eternity. It sounds easy. It's, it's difficult. Especially in the U.S., it's very difficult. You and I have to love ourselves less and love Jesus the most. And again, that can be really hard for a lot of people. And we don't have to. Jesus isn't forcing us to do that. We don't have to do that. <clears throat> we can be all about ourselves. I can remain focused on me for this life. On my wants, on my needs, on my comforts, on my pleasures, but the Bible tells us, tells me that upon my last breath, my life will be lost. And all that awaits for me is the grave. But if I love Jesus more than myself, if you love Jesus more than your own life, our lives will not be lost for all eternity. We'll be able to keep it. Death will not have the final say. The grave won't be able to hold us. Because Jesus has become our greatest love. We just have to remove ourselves or whatever else that resides in that number one spot in our lives and put the Lord there. Let Him go there. And listen, for me to be, for me to love those around me better, I have to love Jesus the most. Right? It's only from Jesus being first can I love my family and my friends this world better? Because he is my guide. He is what I follow. He is leading me. It doesn't work that way if my spouse is up here and Jesus is down here. I need to follow Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> so Jesus has to be our greatest love. And we have to show it. We have to show it. Which brings us to our third point. Our love for God will be displayed in what he calls us to do. After each response from Peter to Jesus, the Lord gives the disciples a job or a work to be done. And now these are more pastoral positions or leadership roles in the church. And they're ones I take very seriously. But Jesus tells Peter to feed my lambs, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep. Peter was to demonstrate his claimed love for Jesus by taking care of the Lord's sheep, the Lord's followers. Notice, though, that they're not Peter's sheep. They belong to the Lord, just as you, church, belong to the Lord. Okay? You're his sheep. I'm just the under-shepherd. Under okay? To care for you, to care for the flock, to nourish you, to feed you God's word. That's my job. But it's not just in these specific roles or tasks that we prove our great love for the Lord. <clears throat> It could be in any office of the church or any other ministry. Anything he calls us to do. Even if that just means turning off our phone. Canceling the streaming service. Reading his word instead of going to YouTube to find an answer. And do you love me, Christian? Yes, I do. Then you need to cancel that subscription and go to church. You need to get off the internet and get to my word. Do you love me, son or daughter? Yes, Lord, I do. Then show me. Then show me. The point here is to display our great love for Jesus and the work or action he calls us to do. Something we have heard of before. 
Flip over to John chapter 14. verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you will what? Okay. Keep my commandments or obey. Exactly. If you love me, you will show it. Church, if you love him, then we need to show him. In other words, we need to prove it. Right? He's already shown us his love by being crucified for us. Now we need to show him. That he is our greatest love. It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart, which is exactly what Jesus is seeking. Which brings us to our fourth point here. Jesus is going after our heart. Why? Because God knows our heart better than we do. And he's trying to shape it and form it and model it after him. And that is truly what he is after and why the Lord asked Peter three times if he really loves him. Why does he do that? Not to rub it in Peter's face. Not to say, I told you so, Peter. You should have listened to me, Peter. He doesn't do that to prove his point or to be right. Peter was grieved. Peter was upset because he understood the significance of the third asked by the Lord and what it meant to his own heart. He was reminded of his mistake that night he denied Jesus. Look at verse 17. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything and you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Peter was upset and grieved. And again, he was reminded of the mistake he made, those three mistakes. And even after that last denial, if you remember, Peter ran away. He was distraught. He was deeply grieved. He was deeply sorrowful because of what he had done and what his heart revealed about Jesus. He fell, and he fell hard because his heart was not where it needed to be. And so Jesus asked the third time to gently press home what the Lord is seeking in him, and even in all of us. It's a heart. He's after our heart. And this third time here, Jesus uses Peter's own word for love, phileo. Peter, do you phileo love me? And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know everything. You know I phileo love you. You know my heart. And in Peter's case, as in many, his heart was about him, himself. And it was reflected in his pride, believing he would go to his death and never deny Jesus. And was Peter hurt? Yeah, absolutely. It hurt Peter, not because Jesus wanted to hurt his disciple, but because that was Peter's heart. He made that mistake of not loving Jesus the most. And so those things had to be removed from Peter's heart, from his life. And it was uncomfortable. And it didn't feel good. But necessary for this follower to move forward in his faith. And it won't be comfortable for us either. It won't be comfortable for us. It's going to be uncomfortable when someone or something else besides Jesus becomes our greatest love. We will need to be reminded and realign that it may not feel very good, but it will be necessary. It will be necessary as we continue on our faith, even until the very end. Look at verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you were... You, you were you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. 
This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. Jesus tells Peter how he will die. Thanks, Lord. <laughs> Not sure if that's good or bad, but I don't know if I can deal with that. Uh, that he will be crucified, though. And it's a prophecy of Peter and martyrdom. Jesus, Jesus called devotion to himself by Peter to be his greatest love would even entail the disciples' own death. Peter would live roughly three decades after this, serving the Lord all the while in anticipation of his last few breaths. But even in his, even in his anticipation, Peter's heart would continue to be focused on God and keep the Lord as his greatest love until those final moments. Because even in Peter's death, his desire was to glorify God and not himself. Legend has it that stories have it that Peter wanted to be crucified upside down because he didn't want to take away from the Lord's cross. He didn't want to um, look, he looked at more than the Lord's cross. Okay. But we also see his heart. We see this reflected as he would write his final epistle. Flip over to 1 Peter. Peter chapter 4 we'll pick up in verse 14 Peter writes if you are insulted for the name of Christ you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Whose name? The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Right? Whenever any Christian follows Christ, he or she must be prepared to suffer, to be, to be persecuted, even prepared to lose their life. But that can only be accomplished with a heart that is deeply devoted to Christ. That can only be accomplished with a heart that has kept Jesus as the greatest love. And that is a heart that seeks to glorify God even in death. Which brings us to our last point. Our heart has to be right to follow Jesus. Our heart has to be right to follow Jesus. Jesus had to do a work in Peter's heart. Jesus had to get Peter's heart back in the right order, if you will, before the disciple could move forward, before the disciple could glorify God. And after this discussion with his disciple, after helping Peter realign his heart, Jesus tells Peter what? Follow me. Follow me. And it's only when we truly love Christ that we truly follow him. In fact, whatever we love most is that which we will follow. That is what will lead us. The Bible tells us wherever your where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is that going to be Jesus for us? Is that going to be Jesus for you? Will he be your greatest love? Is he your greatest love? Or is it going to be someone or something else that can't lead us to eternal life? need to take a closer look. Is Jesus greater than these? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for showing us how much you love us and sending your son to die for us. Help us, Lord. Help us to examine our lives God, they love you in return. Help us, Lord, to love you with all of our hearts and all of our mind and all of our strength. That you would be first. That you would be our greatest love. 
right? And remove those distractions from us, those things that pull us away, or those things that we think we need. All we need is you, Jesus. Remove those things that are not helping us follow you. And help us to hear your voice. To know what to get rid of. Or what to keep. But guide us, Lord. It's not easy. This is a big, a big and difficult change for some. examine our own lives and if you're not our first and greatest love then remind us that you need to be have that conversation with us just like you did Peter but continue to guide us as we go through this world Lord glorify you so that nothing would take that place in our lives not even ourselves God you love us you love us so much help us to love you so much in return Go before us. Go before us and may your glory be known. And may you be praised in all that we do. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.